boy, and there is that. Hi, everybody. Welcome How are you to doing, Tune Pad. I'm Marty Dundix, editor in chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine. And this is a live edition of the fabulous podcast, The Cartoon Pad, hosted by New York cartoonist Bob Eckstein and Michael Shaw. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Marty. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Welcome to The Cartoon Pad. Uh, in this show, we're going to be answering questions. Um, Actually, I'll just get one question out of the way right now is something I've been asked the last couple of months is where has the podcast been? And uh, Michael was boycotting Spotify. And uh, my psychiatrist was recommending I take a break from Michael. I have a question, Bob. Shoot. Where where, where have all the flowers gone? <laughs> what was that question? Have all the flowers gone? Oh, this is your musical interlude. This is uh, Michael Shaw, who uh, ha has a neck injury, and he's yes, I, I have a, I have a growth. It. I have a growth on my neck. Y yes, let's and please explain. Yeah, go ahead. yes, this is my cat Buttercup, who enjoys sitting on my neck, and Buttercup has sat on my neck so long that I now have cat neck. Which is, is like cat really why your neck is is up? Is it because I of the cat? don't know. Who knows why? It's age. It's 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 a combination of things. Okay. I, thought, I don't know the combination, so I can't. You know. Your cartooning schedule. Ooh, you 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 vocoded on me there, Marty. Yeah, Am I you, on? No, you, you you did some kind of special effects. Can you do that for all of us? Yes. We feel sounded like there. you sounded like share there for a second. I don't know what you're talking about because it's me if it's a, it's a, an error. So, right. oh, no, this does not. Uh, a, a, a bad neck does not affect my the quality of my cartooning. No. OK. Then the main thing we established is that we all brought a B game. <laughs> yes. To what? This. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, game. No, but we, we've all had some injuries the last couple of months. We all had some stuff that we were dealing with. I had gotten COVID. I have also gotten twice. A, twice. I got a torn rotor cuff, and that was from using a heavy pen nib. And <laughs> I've, been on, I've been taking physical therapy since and uh, special diet, acupuncture, and a whole bunch of other things. It would be easier for me to explain what I'm not having done. And so we were away for a while, but it's great to be back. You know, Bob, I think you'd look a lot better after all that treatment. Thank you. Now, that's just the video thing. Marty's going to do this in post. Yeah, we'll fix it in post. I'll do one of those reface things and make him look just fantastic. We'll add some glitter and I wonder all if he looks older stuff. since the last time we were on. Sorry. We look about <laughs> the same. We look you guys look the same. We look the same, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Marty, yeah. Um, maybe we could also uh, encourage and explain to the audience that they could live chat questions as we're doing the show. I'm going to do it for like an hour, but sure. you want to explain that? Um, wherever they're watching, people can watch on Twitch. They can watch on Facebook. They can watch on YouTube. And I think they can watch on LinkedIn and Twitter. So we'll, we'll, we are simulcasting this presently. So if anyone's watching and they have a, a chat thingy in whatever platform they're, they're, they're talking to, you can uh, write in the comments um, wherever you are, and we'll see it, and we'll put it up on the screen, and uh, that can be a question that the uh, for, for the cartoonists. So if you guys have any cartooning questions for people that are authors, New Yorker cartoonists, uh, anything, um, you know, how to be a cat wrangler, how to balance a cat on the back of your neck, any Safe questions way. like that. Um, oh. put them in the, in the chat and we'll put them up on the screen and, uh, Bob and Shaw will, will answer your questions. And before we did the, the live show, we had people submit questions ahead of time on the Facebook. Right. So we have those questions to go through too, but what are you guys working on right now? And what is your current submission schedule for the magazine stuff? So like, do you guys both have a batch together for the New Yorker? Uh, for this week or this month, or how does it work? No, no, Marty. No, we don't. <laughs> no, Michael, <laughs> seriously. Um, 
Mike, you are submitting, no. aren't you? Uh, I got a I got an email that there's no meeting, so there's no batches due. So well, that's true. Uh, so what happened was is there's a sabbatical at the New Yorker, but you know, a lot of people will continue doing their batches anyway and just kind of stockpile. You're not doing I that. never stockpile. Stockpiling at, uh, leads to uh, stale inventory. You don't want to stockpile. Well, I did some cartoon. You wanted it fresh. I wound up sending them elsewhere. <laughs> I submitted to uh, the other Cat place. Fancier. Cat Fancy. Apathy Magazine. Okay. Um, I sent it <laughs> to Airmail. Sir? Airmail? <laughs> Airmail. Uh, uh, they, they pick up a lot of good cartoons at Airmail. Right. Swank. That, I'm, that, I'm Bob, that, to... that, that Bob Mankoff's over there at the airmail. Lots of funny stuff. I see a lot of um, Lars. I see Lars there sometimes. I see Ivan there sometimes. They pick up a lot of good cartoons. I think I've my seen problem... one of my favorite, Jeff Hobbs. He's been in there a couple of times. Oh, my. My problem with airmail is the, the pages are so thin. because It's, it's like they're not mail. even there. It's, it's like, like onion skin. You can see right no. through it. It's like it's just an email or something. I know. There's no like air. They, instead of calling it airmail, they should just call it email. Well, it's got this retro feel, except it, uh, you know, and it does look rather retro. But well, I you know what that's from, right? Yeah, I do. What? Yeah, I mean, it's full from Graydon Carter's, um, his own magazine, Spy Magazine. It's a sister of that. It's all a carryover. He's carried over the same sensibilities and same design sense. It's the same look. It's really nice. I've learned something here. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> we should mention. So my, you, uh, you actually, you were in Spy. You were a Spy guy. I was a major contributor. I did a few hundred a major, pieces there. Did you actually I, get paid? I heard they never paid anyone. No, they, you know, it was tough. You guys are always trying time. to start stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we got to stir it. the pot here, man. We don't have to stir any pots. They can, we can just have ah. a regular pot. <laughs> no, I worked for them and I was, I, uh, I wrote for them and I illustrated and I was not doing gag cartoons for them because I had not done gag cartoons at that time. I did that much later and I did it only at the tail end of Spy's uh, life. They closed down too early. What was Spy Every all about? Because I think Spy was before I was really into any sort of publications, but I, I, I know that Spy was kind of like an iteration of, of what kind of what New York magazine slash vulture slash all of those, you know, Gawker, what all those kind of websites do, but it was all just in one magazine where it well, was like yes. critiques and it was art and it was cartoons and it was like, is that well, what it was? No, well, it was always humor. It didn't have serious critiques. Oh, they didn't, didn't have, have any articles no. that weren't humor? Okay. It wasn't like it had an AV club that the gotcha. Onion has. This yeah. is was straightforward mocking and parodying uh, the paparazzi's uh, targets, whether it's a celebrity, politicians, whatever. They were always trying to knock down the big names. And yeah. so that was their niche. But they I also enjoyed had, Spy. And what I liked about it was the minutia of its content. It would have these little subscripts that were like seven point type. And well, you, yeah. You read, you was read them Spy at your in own New York or was that a, a UK thing? It was in New York. I remember what I remember one time in the sign that was given to me to follow up on Michael's comment. They asked me to do portraits of William F. Buckley, and they wanted to use it for a chart and use it as icons. So they asked me to draw 40 different faces of him, and they said, do it the size of a pencil eraser. And we did, I did it something that was like the size of a penny, and then we shrunk it down half the size. And we use it that way. So Michael's right. In the margins, their, their sort of um, their thing was to always have these microscopic type of uh, type. You needed a ma magnifying glass to follow it. It yeah. was my favorite part of the magazine. It was like Sergio Aragonis in Mad Magazine. I would just yeah. get a Mad Magazine and look at the borders and just read the uh circuitous little comments that kind of went up and down the uh edge of the paper a lot good. of people I, a lot of people i worked for there went on to really big things and they they show up on tv and then in the new yorker and other places but that that group there was pretty big it's it's that magazine that i 
I met uh, Gilbert Godfrey, who was working mm-hmm. there. And they would have like house parties where the performer was They Might Be Giants. Who, oh, that's fun. And they were classmates of mine. I, I was friends with John at Pratt Institute. We were classmates. And it was this real small inner group that kind of exploded later. We, I saw them all over in different ways. Not that I kept in touch with all of them, but they were all very successful and talented. And you should have kept. You should have kept in touch, Bob. Then you'd be talking to someone other than us at this moment. Well, believe I know, me, really. I'd like to. I mean, I, I would like to keep in touch with them, like like Kurt Anderson and Graydon Carter. If I ran into them now, they would not recognize me. But you know, that's what you happens when you're dealing with hundreds of people all over the place. Yeah, but you still got your hair, so they would recognize you. Okay, you know, Bob has to tell his famous uh, Donald Trump check story. No. Oh, I will. But first, I wish Marty could cut that part out about my haircut. I'm no. still hurting about this. We are doing this live. That is. That means I am no, not editing. I went. I'm editing cuts, no part of this. And I broke up with my hairdresser. Um, Your hair looks haircut, good. What are you talking about? It is not good. It's cut way too short for my liking. I Who told cares? him not to cut it too short. It'll grow back. Okay. You know, Bob, you, you really <laughs> do have a generous forehead at this moment. Well, I know this. There's a lot of forehead there for us all to share. I told you not to bring this up. You could, you could land a uh, small aircraft on your forehead, I think. So you just have, quick, just quickly, I'll get, get it. I'll change the subject. Okay. I was involved in Spy's most famous story. I did the piece with uh, where they gave checks of like five cents or three cents to celebrities like Cher and Donald Trump. And then Donald Trump and Cher and these, these big names – Cash the checks to show how cheap they were. And how much was the the check for? One like one dollar, one cent. I think for Donald Trump it was a nickel. Nice. It was a nickel, and I I was just working on the piece, just cranking out pieces. I worked on every issue, and I didn't know it would get any traction. But next thing I knew, it was on like NBC Four and other TV shows picked it up because it involved Donald Trump and it was a chance for him to get skewed. And that really was the first time that he got some really bad publicity publicly that they they put the spotlight on him and it began there, I think. And then they just destroyed your life and career. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) He got on the list. No, it's all good. I I do miss that. that. But but that was a long, that was much, that was much earlier than you starting to do cartoons for the New Yorker though. Yeah. I mean that, that was when I was doing illustration for different magazines and I was working for, I was working for like real simple magazine. I was doing my my bread and butter was making money doing redesign for places like uh, Boston Globe. Boston okay. Globe would hire me to redesign their sports section. That was a huge account, and then I was able to do some more fun jobs. Well, that's wonderful. Ah, it's all, it's actually very sad because I think of all the magazines that are gone now, like Seven Days you mentioned and and places like that. Boy, uh, Bob, those redesigns really worked out well, didn't they? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's, you want to introduce our first guest? We have a guest. We have a guest? Yeah, we, we have, have Michael. Guest? We're going to introduce Michael. Oh, yeah. Because yes, he's going to answer the questions, but we should set this up in a way. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's do this properly. Our sure. first guest has been on the cartoon pad more than any of a cartoonist. His cartoons have appeared in the New Yorker since 1999, and his work has also been in the New Yorker book of literary cartoons, the complete cartoons of the New Yorker, the Rejection Collection 1 and 2, the New Yorker Encyclopedia of Cartoons, the Ultimate Cartoon Book Series, and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I'm going to cut it right there. He also just wrote The Elements of Stress, which was published by Humorous Books. And I actually had a hand in that. There you go, Michael. Look at Thanks, that. Bob. You forgot to mention my first publication was for the Athenian, Greece's largest English language magazine, which I sold a spot drawing in 1980 of a waiter carrying some drinks on a tray. <laughs> and I was quite pleased at that point. Well, thanks for the added energy you put in that story. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. The only thing I'm we're missing it, now, man. the only thing we're missing now from this podcast is like some sexual tension. Um, that's, 
<laughs> let's let's go straight to the first question. I, I'll yeah. go first. Um, we got some questions sent in. Um, this first question, they asked that we not reveal their identity as it's a big name artist. So I'm just going to use their first name. Can you just, yeah, use their first name? Just or use their use, first name. How about this? Use their real name, but change the first letter of each first and last name with a W. All right. Thanks for making that simple. Okay. So what is the apparent huge appeal of the webtoon poorly drawn lines all about? I've tried to understand it through its Facebook comments, but no luck. Thanks, Roz. No, I'm <laughs> only kidding. It was? wasn't. No, no, I'm only kidding. It wasn't Roz. It's was Charles, it? Charles Rast. Okay, do either one of you know what poorly drawn lines is? Hell no, no other than my own. No, it's yeah. like, yeah, they're very, it's good. It it has 2 million followers, Holy. which is more followers than we have together, Michael. But about 200. Together. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like 2 million more. Um, And I see the appeal. You know, I'm going to answer this question first. I'm going to dive in, and then, Michael, you can add if you wish. Um, there's a gridlock of style with cartoons, and poorly drawn lines, to me, is has this attitude and provides a different style. It has a new world to escape to, and that's no different than when George Booth came on the scene and, and he created a new world. So I think there's a great appeal when a cartoon could do that and just create a new world. I think that... Um, the question was maybe working off of the old criteria of crafting a joke. Yeah. But if you're just going to do that, to stand out the way you have to from all the other cartoon styles is you have to be just totally out funny, funny above all the others. Well, you just can't do that now. I mean, because like everything else in this ass backwards country, nobody could even agree on what's funny. So to say that something is like blatantly funnier than everything else, I, th I think it's really hard. And that's where poorly drawn lines makes a distinction. It's really in its own corner. And uh, if Bob, you, if Bob, you check it you, out. Can you give us an example? You know, I can't because the work is not like a traditional gag cartoon. That's why it stands out. If you go to Instagram, you could just type in poorly drawn lines. But it's a very graphic looking cartoon, very flat. And I can see how it appeals to younger generations because it's very simplified and it doesn't leave much to, you know, any cryptic messages or any type of mystery of what the uh, joke is. So I hope I'm going I hope to Instagram for the right sent, now. I'll be back. Yeah. For the person who sent in, I hope that kind of answered the question. I do like that. Yeah, thanks, person. Uh, Roz, Roz, thanks for that question. And that, that person who wrote in, I like their work, but I have to say, their work is funny, but their style could be mistaken for other cartoonists. So I think that there's something to be said for someone who's just, you know, really drawn lines. Okay, I'm looking. Marty, you're a cartoon editor. Do you do you see the um, the thinking behind what my answer was? Yes, I think. I don't know. I'm not <laughs> a great cartoon editor. I just think I pick things that are funny, and if the pictures look good. And uh, that's pretty much the criteria. Well, I'll tell you, I can't. There's no batches for the New Yorker this week, so I'm trying to break into that market. The weekly humorous. So yeah. I'm, I'm. I'll let you in, maybe. I'm looking at poorly drawn lines, and there's okay. a snail wearing sunglasses, and the first caption is, "I'm not just a snail in sunglasses. I own multiple pairs in different styles." And I have to say, uh, I'm going to completely disagree with you, Bob, as usual. And this really reminds me of Nancy. These are just Nancy's. You said look, sunglasses on a snail. Yes, but if you look at the drawing, they're just very simple, repetitive, very droll. I will fulfill. Okay, there's a fish. So are you giving this a thumbs down? No, but I, I'm just saying it's not a different world. It's just a reiteration of many worlds that have come before it. It's just the next version of it. I agree what you said, but I think that's still a valid point of creating a different world. Everything's based on something else. There's no one who's going to be – if you're totally original, you're going to lose your audience. You have to have some familiar ground for someone to sort of grab hold to. Would you agree I with that? I have two words for you. Futsy nutsel. Everyone Again? who's listening, both of you guys, 
look up Futsy Nutzel. He has sensibilities as a cartoonist. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Very well, well put, I guess. We have two questions from a Sarah Morset, who is a New Yorker cartoonist. And I'm just going to start with this one after you totally put a bow on the last question. Thank you. Uh, the question I ask myself is why I keep drawing all these cartoons that will probably never see the light of day. Is it a compulsion? It needs to make people laugh, a challenge? Because it certainly isn't for the big bucks. I guess I'm wondering what motivates people at the beginning and makes them want to continue after many years of rejection and few sales. Okay, I have some answers. Yes, no, yes, maybe. Keep trying. Oh, good God. Okay, well, I'm, I'll say, I'll answer this question. I'm going to let you answer her second question, which is my answer is that everyone says they love cartooning and we love cartooning. And people say, I would do this even if I wasn't paid. But I, I don't know if that's actually true. If you weren't going to be published somewhere and if someone didn't see your cartoons, if you really was, if you really would do it. I mean, that's, I don't know. I don't think anybody would really cartoon if they said they had zero audience. But there is a prize. Uh, I know that when I got into the New Yorker the first time, it was very exciting. I mean, you appear in, alongside the likes of like Leo Cullum and Michael Maslin and others kind of an honor. And I think that thrill, that rush carries you over to want to get in again. And it's, it's exciting to see it in print. It was more so back then when you were next to legends, but it's, it's a validation thing. I mean, with me, it's like getting, you know, love me daddy. Okay. Trying to get my father's approval. Uh, not that the likelihood of that happening now is very strong. It would require a seance, but I, or a shovel. All, I, I'm always thinking in terms of I, I, when I'm doing cartoons, I'm always thinking this is a cartoon that's going to make my dad laugh and finally say that, Oh, he's funny. And I, I was always chasing that. I'm going to say it's a not uh, unhealthy compulsion. So I was just looking up uh, Henry Darger Jr. Is it Jr. or Henry Darger? Are you familiar with him? Yeah, thanks for staying on subject. I am. So he was an outside artist, and he was a writer. And his one book, The Realms of the Unreal, was 15,145 pages, bound in 15 immense densely typed volumes that never saw the light of day. I think it all got thrown in a dumpster and someone found no, it. No, no, no. It was on display. I saw it at the – I'm a big fan of his – at the museum right. of um, the American Folk Art Museum, had retrieved a lot of his work, and they did a big right. exhibit of his work about ten years ago. That it gets a little bit different there, though, because that work is not meant for public consumption. It's actually quite scary, and he is an outsider of order, artist. That's like sort right, of right. But my point is, if, my point is, if you're sending in cartoon after cartoon, and it's never getting published, it's not meant for out side consumption either you're fulfilling some internal need to express yourself and send it out so it's sort of like the message in the bottle so the action of doing that is just as important as it getting published the publishing the you know the ultimate unattainable goal or attainable i i don't i have no problem with that it's interesting Good you say you. that because i think i think some people would just say that's part of the process to reaching creative heights is that you know that you have to do a certain amount of those cartoons and getting rejected is part of it. And it's like sort of that thing. You have to do something a thousand times before you perfect it. So you're saying it's not that as much as the motivation that's driving you is, is the compulsion. Yes. You, you, you've got to be a bit compulsive. I mean, there's no way you can't be. I just had an email from someone who's trying to watch us live. This guy named Jerry Fisher, and hopefully he'll be able to get to the YouTube or the Facebook and ask us a question. Hi, and, Jerry. Uh, I don't know if he's watching yet, but when uh, when he is watching, Jerry, if you're watching, uh, type a comment and we'll put it up on the screen. So I know that uh, you figured out how to get to us here, but that was only a minute ago. So well, Michael, we took a, we took a Port Sarah's question, but what is the answer though? 
where do where do you tell where do you tell someone to comfort them when they say she she's asking herself the same question we all ask ourselves on the late Sunday night when we have to come up with the rest of the batch we say is this worth it? Well, Bob said Mr. Rankoff said that some dreams should never die. So if this is your dream, there's no reason for you to kill it. There's plenty of other people that will kill it for you. So I say draw on. Draw on all you cartoonists. <laughs> Get those images down. There's one more guy in the desert cartoon that needs to be published. Yeah, well, I, my thing I say to my students is that you don't have to do it for a living. If you put I never that, have, so that's true. You put that type <laughs> of you put that type of pressure on yourself. Yeah. It changes everything. And it's yes, not actually I, helping you being more creative. But I'm gonna do something that I probably have never done before and agree with you. Yeah. Well don't it's true. Don't cut that out. I'm not cutting any. None of this is getting edited. Bob. All right, all right, Marty. And, this whole and thing about never, it being live is very. It's funny. never getting edited ever again. It's very funny that you say we're going live. We get the joke. It's over. You got your little joke in. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Here's <laughs> Sarah's next question. Sounds uh, like my ready? girlfriend. <laughs> I know. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Come on, Michael. Hold on. Okay. How does one find that thing that defines them? Is it a hunch that eventually becomes more clearly defined over time, or is it a conscious decision? Does one say, I want to create moody and dark and mysterious cartoons or silly and light cartoons? Same question with visual style. Or are very conservative looking or warped, twisted, and scratchy? Oh, my goodness. All right, so there's eight questions here. <laughs> Let's just skip to the last questions. How does one reach that point? Does it evolve or is it or has it been by some deliberate change? Drawing okay, a new I, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that with next question. So I have a question. Uh all right. I, I would say edit that and get back to us. Okay. But I'm uh, gonna edit it right now for you. She wants to know how does a person know? And I'm sorry, Sarah, because you you didn't sound um, come on, Sarah. Get it together. Long-winded here at all. It's me. No, I said no. it, I, I said it in a way that wasn't dramatic. The point she's making is: when does a person realize, have some self-awareness of what their style is? Is it a conscious decision or does it evolve? And Michael, with you, it, was there a point in you realizing when your style became your style? Yes, and when I was told how to draw, I was told by the New Yorker to not draw funny. Do not draw funny. So I, everyone out there, don't draw funny. Just draw. Don't try to be funny. If you try to be funny, you're not. All right, you're but painful. I, I see what just, you're saying, but just do your best to draw the thing you're trying to draw. Not even your you best. Just you could try your best. I mean, I, I eliminated fingers and wrists. It was easier. Oh, I see. That makes sense. I yeah, actually if you have look a at my if you look at my drawings, there's parts missing. I because I didn't there want are, to draw them. There are some parts missing. All right, Michael, listen, you you're answering one part of the question of what you were told, but at the time you were told, did did you know that you were making that sort of decision and you were going down a road and you knew that your style was the right voice for you? Well, if I wanted to sell a cartoon, it was so hell yeah. I mean, I. I want to. I'm speaking this, to Sarah. This I'm is speaking not complicated. Here. Well, I'm speaking to Sarah now, which is also. Oh, there's my. I love mm -hmm. that cartoon that I sent to Marty, by the way. Don't you love all the cartoons that you do? No. Oh, look at all these ads that all of a sudden we're getting on the screen. Some here. of them I like. Ching. Don't just stand don't, there, throw it in the pot. Ugh, don't go to Michael's house for dinner. Who yeah, knows what's going to be I, in there? You took out your donkey. Don't just stand there, your donkey. Throw it in the pot. I know. He's I didn't British. get the donkey thing. That, I guess is oh, that, is that a very... It's supposed to be um, Gordon Ramsay. Right. I'm going to do a spinoff of Sarah's question, which is... You know, you Sarah's are... had her moment. We're moving on. Oh, well, then let me... Okay, come hey, is on. Is this like some friend of yours? This she... No, no. She is now because she has been on the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to give She's a shout out to our, our website. Which podcast? This podcast, you imbecile. Uh, she was on this podcast just now. 
She oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, I sir. Was guest. She wasn't right, a guest me, on the podcast. Yes, Sarah Morissette is a lot of OTC uh, over the counter medications. Right? Oh, Sarah Morissette, the cartoonist. No, the oh, musician. I thought you meant Alanis Morissette. She's so no. Angry. There's a cartoonist. Yeah. Okay. No. Let me give I, her I, website. I apologize. Yes. Let me give out her website. It is uh, Morissette at a t dash, and the way we spell Morissette is. The usual way, M O R R I S S E T T E at dot at. That's where it is. So check is out it, our work. Isn't it? Isn't it ironic? Don't you think? Oh, a little gosh. too ironic. But well, that's Atlantis more said. Uh, Michael, hit no, us. I have a question. Work. No, I get to do the next question. You, Please. You've okay. So this comes from a Beth Lawler. Administrator New Yorker cartoon caption contest rejects parentheses and enthusiasts, close parentheses. And she asks simply, crisply, to pun or not to pun? That is the question. Bob? Well, I'll give a quick answer. I mean, anything that works, if it's hilariously funny, you can do and break any rule you want. Yeah, but in general, puns tend to be dumbed down, and what happens is is that you are not allowing the reader to engage in like how to have that eureka moment. If you can do a cartoon that a person can kind of get, but they have to they have to test themselves to, to make it work. It's not so you know blatantly simple. I think that's more satisfying for the viewer, and puns don't supply that. Marty. When to pun or not to pun? I think it's, pun. you know, I think it t totally depends on the pun. It totally depends on the cartoon. Some uh, just aren't funny or some are too hard to, you know, a lot of times a joke that sound that's it's very sound related. You know, it's 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 a joke that has to be told does not work as a cartoon because it is being read in your mind and looked at on a piece of paper I and will. it doesn't. It doesn't work. So it, it totally depends on the joke. It, 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 if it's if it's if it's a joke that's based on the pronunciation of a word, difficult. If you're reading it, I agree. I mean, I think most people don't really understand what a pun is because the pun is based on exploiting the meanings of words and messing. Like them today around. on the weekly humorous hashtag game, which is basically a pun game, we always have uh, a dumb dumb thing, a, a joke to start with. And it was surly cereals. So it was like apple jerks or strife cereal <laughs> or, you know, you know, honey smack. Go to hell face. flakes. Yes. Raisin I hell to, bran. I want and you to just die. Granola. All it is. All it is is wordplay. So it's just like a crazy amount of puns. And it's like thousands of puns come throwing, you know, on, on Twitter at, at, you know, every Wednesday at 11 on this hashtag game. It's just a flood. And it's fun because, you know, everybody had like some people have the exact same ideas. So you'll, you'll see the exact same joke a thousand times. But then you'll see some people who are really who are really uh, out of the box thinkers and they'll come up with something that's so funny. And I love that. And it's just a fun uh, game to play. But it's definitely it's a muscle that you have to flex, it's not, you know, a joke writing pun, like that a little pun it's joke not illustrated. muscle. It's not, I, I do an illustrated, um, I'll take the best joke out of our writers. That's the easiest to do. And I'll make an image to go with it to launch the game. So, so it'll be a, 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 there'll be an accompaniment. So I did a, 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 a parody design of strife cereal with a pissed off child. Wow. Uh, and Get that was Mikey. Fun. He hates yeah, it. Exactly. So my thing is, that most of the pun cartoons I see aren't puns. They're like, I saw, I just went pun cartoon and, and looked at the first one that popped up and it was like a bunch of balloons and one's deflated and, and, and the uh, caption is stand back, give him air, which is not a pun. It's just a visual joke because it's a deflated balloon. So I've made a few attempts at puns. My favorite being, this Buddhist monk at the hot dog stand. And he says, make me one with everything. But that's oh, I like not, that. yeah, no, but that's, that's not a, that's not a pun. I'm I not mean, saying there that I'm not saying it isn't. It's good. Do you, um, do you think there's such a thing as like visual, there's visual puns, of course, but those are totally 
good. They're very rare. They're yeah. hard. I, uh, I don't know. You see things like if you go back and look at very early cartoons, there'll be like a pair full of matches that had all these matches poked at it, and it'll say, "A oh, well matched pair." This is our strife cereal. Oh Lord, I'm a pissed off. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I did Mom's wipe. Now Cat and Grouch, saliva. Grumpy Nut Cheerios, Br Brazen oh. Brand. I think Scorn Flakes is a good one. Scorn was a good one overall for anything that had the word corn in it. Yeah, but puns are good. But um, you know, smarter jokes, um, you know, always probably do a little bit better. It depends so on the venue. It's a, it if it's for, for kids. Yeah. If it's for yeah. kids, it's great. That's so, true. Like uh, say, like Kit Lively, Kit Lively and Dave DeGrand had a uh, had a great kids book that was, you know, wordplay, jokes, riddles, gags and stuff. And it was for kids. So it was tons of jokes, puns, you know, funny thing like knock knocks. And it was for kids. So it was, you know, it was written at a level that was, but it was still funny. You know, it's still funny. It was still clever, you know. Yes. So we're going to say to Beth, hold the puns. You'll save some carbs. <laughs> okay. okay. Do I have any good puns up here right now? I don't know. I don't know. I, These are some I, good I, ones. This is a Jeff Hobbs. This is a uh, oh, let's see. Uh, Drew Pankery. Um, this is a uh, uh, Dan Mistia, who's very funny. Oh, this is and this was hilarious too. I actually got this cartoon uh, pitched to me right as um, my dad was making an appointment at a uh, ENT, which is an ear, nose, and throat, which I really wasn't that familiar with. And they pitched this to me. And it was an ear, nose, and throat. And the next door, the doctor is putting up ear, nose, throat, and arms. Uh, <laughs> I like it. Always yeah. funny. It's always a, you know, it's you know, there are so many different ways to make a cartoon. There's so many different ways to have a joke, and there's so many different angles to jokes and different types of humor. Like there's a big variety um, in the New Yorker and on Airmail and on Weekly Humorous where. You know, there's there can be a lot of topics like we could all have things with dogs in them, but these are drastically different dog cartoons, right? Yes, I did one. Now that I'm thinking about it, it's a, a favorite trope. He said, she said, prehistoric uh, caveman, cave woman sitting next to uh, a fire, and the woman saying, "Now you should discover fiber." Good God! Because he's just eating a stick. So we have bomb red coming in from Con Gray. Did you see that? I did. I don't know what it means, so I'm not going to put it on the I, screen because it doesn't. Uh, I don't know if it makes any sense. But thank you for the comment. Paste that into their browser and see if they get a virus. Yeah, I think that, that actually might happen. So we're not going to do oh, that. Cool. But uh, if people are watching and have any comments or questions, they can put them up on the screen if they just type them into um, whatever the chat is on Facebook or YouTube or Twitch or Snitch or uh, to Twitter or I don't know what people are on. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I should uh, explain that I'm hearing from people who are saying that they wanted to join us. They haven't found the link. I'm sharing the link now. The link is literally anywhere you go. That's a Weekly Humorous social media platform. Yeah, so I, I shared that on Twitter okay. and Facebook, but people can listen to this tape, and that's fine too. Mm -hmm. we got some more questions. Uh, Michael, why don't you go with another question before I go into my pile? Ah, okay. Uh Bob, can we look forward to seeing any of your work in the upcoming rejection collection? No. Okay, good. I was it rejected. Got, it got rejected. There's going to be another book that's just going to be a pile of papers on the floor, and that is the rejected collection, rejection, rejected pile. I was oh, rejected. I, and that's just going to be balled up pieces of paper. Issue. And uh, balled up pieces of paper in the garbage is where you're going to find Bob's new collection yes. of the rejection collection rejected. Well, thank nice you for bringing up a very painful part of my life. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm only doing that because I am in the rejection collection. Oh, well, bully for you. I know. And I was contacted <laughs> by Matt Diffie to resend my signature at higher resolution. Oh, well, la-di-da. I, th I, I'm feeling a cover, honestly. So, Wow. Thank wow. you, Beth. Thank you, Beth, you for that question. The, you could be the top rejected cartoon. No, I won't be, but. I was amused by that. And I think it's funny that he's asking for your signature and this is your signature. Your signature is ridiculous. This, yes. this thing right here, this little squiggle is what it's he's getting at a higher resolution. You want an inscrutable signature. Bob has a very nice signature, but it's this? too easy to read. This looks like you sneezed uh, while you happen to be holding a pen. 
is what it is true that your, look like. your first cartoon you sell and whatever signature that is, you're stuck with it. You can't change it. Yeah. You can change it every cartoon if you wish. Who cares? Uh, I mean, no one notices. You could change it each time. Bob. I got lazy when I would be doing uh, illustrations for New York Press, and uh, I did some for a bunch of magazines, Progressive Magazine and stuff. I would have a, just a signature that I liked, and I would just copy and paste it over sure. and over again. And I would change the hue sometimes. So it looked like sometimes it was matching some of the colors that were in the color illustration. But it was always... Marty Dunnick's written it the exact same way. I did it like a couple, like maybe one or two times in the very beginning. And then I was like, enough of this. And I was just like, I did insert it in the side. I had the same signature I would use forever. I would, I would end up just like, I would put it on official forms. So I'd just be like, copy paste. I've actually redrawn cartoons because I screwed up the signature. <laughs> That's an yeah. illusion cartoonists have is that people would take notice of that. And people would note only of a cartoonist would know how people sign their cartoons and stuff. No, I, 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 Vehemently disagree. I think your signature A from which the cartoon springs. You know, I Especially remember yours, Bob. I'm going to read. I'm going to repeat a story I've said on the podcast before. I, I took this this attitude from another cartoonist. I remember when Pete Holmes was a cartoonist, and he came into the green room filled with cartoonists. And there was all the different veterans and rookies and all different people sitting waiting to go see Bob Mankoff over at uh, the building at 42nd Street to show their batches. And Pete Holmes announced, does anyone in this room realize that no one cares who's doing the cartoons or that no one matters outside this room? That people don't know the names and the different things of the cartoons. And he was explaining that, uh, you know, this whole pressure of like, you know, You'll be remembered for this or remembered for that. He said it, it doesn't real it doesn't realize it doesn't it's not true. I think it and I think that is the case. You think it, I don't think that is the case now though. I don't think people remember different things. I get asked questions all the time at panels and stuff, like about the cartoons, and they all think that because I'm a cartoonist that I'm responsible and know of all the other cartoons. They yeah. lump everyone together. No one ever says, like, we know a PC Vey cartoon. And people yeah. have, there's people who do the And you don't know them all, Bob? Come on, you should know all these cartoons by memory. Well, we know them, but it's the just fans, the fans remember the cartoons. You They're don't all... have to, because you're you're a talent. So talent should only have to really be responsible for their cartoons. No, but only in our little group do we realize that the group of cartoons in the magazine is not a collective thing, but it's all individuals. We could pick out the individuals, but it it's it's more than that. Mm -hmm. okay. I think there's more awareness than you're giving credit to. I, I I think there's a core of avid fans, and then there's like concentric circles out there of greater vague or vaguer awareness. Because I've heard people say to me, "Doesn't just one person draw all those?" So that yeah, no, that's what I mean. I mean, I'm saying that the only person who's a household name, and I think this was Pete Holmes who has said this too, is is Raj Chaz. Everyone yeah. else kind of almost gets lumped in together. And and then Pete was saying to the group, he goes, no one else outside this room knows each other. They don't know the individual styles and stuff. And I'm not saying that, you know, we shouldn't take great pride in it. I'm just saying that's a fact. And it's something to consider is that we're we're kind of working in a bubble. So that's why you started drawing like Saul Steinberg. <laughs> I think that it's almost as if cartoonists on, on Instagram who are super popular are there, you know, it, they can be in the New Yorker and that's great now, but it's almost like it's almost secondary. If you're really popular in this whole world, it doesn't, it doesn't regardless if it's, we're talking about cartoonists or not, if you are now a influencer on Instagram, you are your own brand. So, and that translates to everything. So, if you're a cartoonist who is an influencer of a cartoon of the cartoon world, you don't even need a magazine anymore. Like the magazine is just a platform. The magazine is just the place that publishes you. But if you are if you are so popular on Instagram that you you have your own subscribers, you have a subscriber base that can rival a magazine, right? So, an individual, an artist, a musician, a model, or whatever, they can like they're their own they're their own brand. 
And and that tra- you know I see that with with cartoonists now too. You know, like Ellis is crazy crazy popular, and and many of them are breaking out, and they're able to just be like they're their own thing. You know, if whether you have your own cartoon, it's become like you 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 don't need that springboard of a New Yorker or, or an airmail. Like you don't need like it's it's almost like they need you. It becomes a, a reverse reciprocal, you know, type relationship with some of the things now with the internet. Bob, anyway, Bob, we should do that. Yeah, we should. Why not? Let's we go. should be. Check out that you know what I think? No, I think? I think you guys should become popular. That's what I think. Sure, I, I think so too. <laughs> That's what I think is missing. <laughs> I want to see miss- a line. Of, I want to see a know. line of socks with your cartoons on them. I want to have like a tote bag. I, I think that would be great. And, I was and, on a tote bag. I was on the tote bag for the fundraiser for the uh, semi-serious uh, documentary. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I, Which I thought, cartoon? Uh, it was the guy that was about to get his head chopped off, and he's he's got his head on the uh, post, and he's holding this recycling bag. He goes, "I brought my own bag." That's good. Do that you was do any, good. Do you that do was... any cartoons that you don't amputate a body part? Uh, tongue. No, uh, I don't know. You've you've got me there. You. I'm All stuck. right. Let me give you. Let me give you an easier question. I got some right. questions there just for you. Here's okay. one right now. Um, let's call this you, the lightning round. Yeah, lightning round. Right. This is All like right, word association, know. except yes. let's make sense of it. Most underrated cartoonists. Who? Uh, uh me. Okay. In order of pre- all of us except Roz, <laughs> how's that? In order of preference, honest answer. Yes. Would you rather be the smartest, the richest, or the funniest person in the world? Ooh, yeah, rich. What the hell? You're not funny then at all, though. You're not Who making cares? anyone laugh. Who cares? I'm the richest person on earth. Come on. Oh, see now, come on. Don't you think you do the cartoons? We we're talking earlier about motivation. Don't you think it's because you have like this thing you just want to make people laugh? Sometimes you I could have that to... thing anyway. If I had all the money in the world, I could have all the thing. So you're hiring you. gag writers. <laughs> I would. Hire Everything you. changes with age. The That's more, right. the money. older you get, the more you know that the, the more I you would wish, the, wish you had money. You're like, I would be the Elon anything Musk. would be easier with money. When I was young, I was like, I don't need money. All money, right, Marty. money Marty. is the source of the root of all evil. And then now I'm old, and I'm like, God, everything would be better so if I just had if, money. If you gave me the choice <laughs> between smart and funny, yeah, I'd go funny. All right, well, let me ask so Reverend you give me Marty the there. Choice between smart and funny and money, Marty. So I go money. What are you picking, Marty? Richest, funniest, or smartest? To be what? The person, the funniest oh. person in the world. I would, I would rather be the richest person in the world. Than Hell yeah! Funniest. Who cares? Just be I, honest. I, you can buy I, gag, I, I you could buy just, I, could, I could hire some very funny writers to give me great lines. Michael, you hear that? I, There's some spillover for you. <laughs> I'm poor, and I still hired uh, gag writers when I would have to uh, host guaranteed delivery, and I needed funny lines. I was like a Bob Hope. I, I. I got uh, uh, AJ Camino, who's a, a writer for Weekly Humorous and The New Yorker. And I remember uh, asking, I was like, I got to host this thing and I have no jokes. And he wrote me like 10 jokes. Oh and my I God. Only, I, I could only use like in, two of them. You just reminded me. I have to get in touch with AJ. I remember talking to him ages ago and I haven't been. So in funny. T- AJ's hilarious. What a funny guy. Is he still doing stand up? I mean, I think a lot of stand up stuff stopped during COVID, but um, he's still doing like funny videos and stuff. And he's writing. See, I mean, he's... it's it's fascinating that Bob Hope was one of the richest men in Hollywood, had a uh, army of gag writers, and he still wasn't funny. Bob Hope was hilarious. Are you kidding uh, me? He was he was funny. America's That's sweetheart. Like, yeah, let me tell player. you, Bob Hope. I've heard friends tell me stories of how he would, um, yeah, he bring all these women to be on the army shows and stuff. Sure. Yeah. And he'd he'd blackmail and he'd say he'd leave them in like Vietnam or something if they, they didn't go to bed with him. He well, this always, just took a turn. This he, took a yes. very short yeah, break. Yeah, he was Bob, Bob, for that. All right. He terrible. Yeah. Bob Bob pre uh 1954 was really funny. Bob yeah. post 1954 was just yeah. What happened in 1954? I don't know. I made that number up. <laughs> 
I didn't oh. her up. It sort of segued out of the uh, road shows and his uh, right. radio shows and then started doing those kind of tired so what do we have things. we have about 10 minutes left here guys. okay let's so bring it back have, let's, uh, let's, have, let's bring this back have, come on let's have some let's fast go, questions all right yeah. um michael no let me come up with a question for you again michael what are the two perfect books to give this valentine's day uh bob you might know that. i'm gonna i'm gonna pass that one back to you oh my god it's the elements of stress Right. And the all's fair in love and war two of books course. in which both michael and i have featured heavily the books would have been big hits if they were banned in Tennessee or something. We need your love. It's a, it is a great Valentine's gift, especially for people who are divorced and single because we uh, tear down all the. You need to laugh, love. you know? You need to laugh. But just, also the you're just sitting alone laugh. in your house, you just need to laugh because the books it's all are, you can do. Yeah, the books on the cartoon book, All is Fair in Love and War, it features Michael heavily. And so you know it's all about despair and and dealing with <laughs> yes. you know separation and everything no else. One, no one, no one yeah, I think we them. have um, that on our bookshop.org weekly humorist uh, funny funny books for Valentine's Day list. So if people want to go to yeah, bookshop.org and they can find the weekly uh, the humorist books page, and we're, we have a featured list I think on their homepage uh, with I think both of those books along with some other hilarious uh, romantic Valentines comedy books excellent yep yep humorous books is the place there. to be yeah get some books pick up these books you can get all these books on amazon bookshop or you can go to humorousbooks.com uh, for appropriate links and whatnot let me squeeze in a question from patty um i'm going to handle this one michael this is sure. can you recommend a specific used ipad model in which i can use procreate um I'll just answer really quickly that Procreate is the digital painting program on iPads. Uh, Patty, you want to get an iPad that is the one that comes with the Apple Pencil because yeah. you want to use it directly on the screen. And that means you want to get the iPads that are the medium size or the larger size. Our producer, Marty, has gotten an iPad, and he's going to chime in. I would in say the get the larger one. I got the smaller one, and I returned it. And it's only a little bit more expensive, but it's much more worth it because it's much bigger. It's like 12 inches, I think. And um, the Apple Pencil, I got the Apple Pencil 2. And there's, there's a 1, but get the 2. It's better. And then get the, um, it's the uh, iPad Pro. I don't, it, it came out like last year. You don't have to get the one that's this year, but get the one that's, I think it's last year. Whatever one works with the Apple Pencil 2. Just check that. Check the compatibility. That's that. right. Yep. As long as it works with the Apple Pencil 2, you're good to go. So you can probably go like yeah. one model or two models uh, old and you'll still be okay. And you can get it on Amazon. You can get one of those refurbished ones. It'll be like $400 cheaper. It's much, It's totally fine. And they're warranted and everything if it's like uh, certified refurbished. And I love it. God, I love yeah. that, that Procreate with that Apple it's, Pencil 2. I, I just to... sold for the first time in 15 years, I went on Craigslist and I had a drafting table here. And I sold it on Craigslist for twenty dollars. It was like a two hundred dollar drafting table. I just wanted to get rid of it, so I put it for twenty bucks. And, and people immediately emailed me and came and picked it up. It was great. And so I have uh, some some kid who went to Harvard for painting, and he's in the city and he's getting back into studio art. And I guess he lives in my neighborhood and he sold it on Craigslist. Came right I over, would, picked it up. Two seconds. It was great. Sorry, Marty. I'd like to add that Sharpie makes a new retractable pen. Point oh seven line. Very sharp. Very Michael, sharpy. you bring up a good point, though. A lot of people think that they have to have Procreate to do the new work. I think the tool is less important than people think. Procreate's great. People always assume that I'm working in Photoshop and Procreate. I've never done a piece in either software. So it does. it's not necessary, but if it makes you happy and that's the best tool for you, then, then dive in. And, Marty, I want to ask you. You do use Procreate, and you like yeah. it. And so you yeah. want to make a little, just a feedback on that from your experience? I love Procreate. I, um, you know, I'm a Photoshop Adobe person on my computer. And, but then the Procreate app is very good. And the, all the different um, brush options and, and the weight of the Apple Pencil and the layers. And it's really flexible with exporting it in, you know, if you want to do it as a, a PDF or as a uh PSD layered uh, Photoshop file or as a TIFF or or whatever. Really easy to export. I really like the colors. 
I'm doing some freelance book illustration for Mr. Mr. Bob right here. Uh, and it's incredible. I love it. It's so much faster than, you know, I would do transparent oil on paper back when I did um, New York Press and, and magazine stuff. And it, it was great. I love the way it looked, but I'd have to scan it and then clean it up. And then my scanner would get covered in oil paint. And it was just like this. It was messy. It took forever. And with the uh, iPad Pro, with the Procreate, it's I can do something that would take me hours uh, I, uh, or days. I can do it in like an hour. And it, it's great. And oh, I can great. sit in my lap and I love it. All right. Thanks, Morty. And thanks, Patty, for bringing in the question. And I yeah. hope that helped you. Um, Michael? That was Tech Talk. Yes. Yeah. Ask why me a don't tech you bring, a, bring us to old school. you have any more questions before we sign off that we can jump in with? Something old school. Yeah. And while you're looking, let me do remind everyone that we will be back, whether people like it or not. And despite what people requested, we are going to come back. And uh, yeah. Uh, Bob, what's your favorite trope? If you had to choose a trope, trope well, the know, light fantastic. I think that some tropes have to be put to sleep because something like the Grim Reaper, I think it's just too much of a memory of what we all have been through in the last two or three years. There are just some tropes that become offensive at some point or just expire. What do you think? I like the tropes that's the easiest to draw. So I Snowman. go with. Yeah, yeah, Snowmen like, are very easy to draw. Yeah, I like. Uh, well, what's a trope? But that's not a trope. No, it's, I'm trying to make it one. But you know, trope. What 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 makes a setup cross the line into tropian territory? I would say just like repeated. You know, like the yeah. therapist being yeah. at the therapist yeah. is a trope. Being sitting at the bar is a trope. But you know, yeah. I'm not sure the tropes right now is the is the answer because the thing is, is we're all getting a little tired. There's like a fatigue. And yeah. I feel like if we're going to break in and people, people are always telling me, you know, they want to get into New Yorker and they're having, you know, there's some people want to get back in and it, it is hard. And I'm trying to be positive and say, look, the left side of the infield is wide open. Like as if there's a metaphor of what's going on now in the gag cartooning landscape, there's this big shift in the infield. It, there's a whole type of cartoon that's it's wide open there for you to hit a ball down the left side or whatever. Yeah. And if you could find that thing and not rely as a crutch and using a trope or using a style that maybe has been considered already done, I think that would be the solution. It's, it's, it's there for anyone to go into. It's, it, you just have to come up with that. Can you, voice. can you describe that shift is this like a pull hitter? I mean, well, I don't want to say explicitly. I think a lot of people would know what I mean stylistically with the cartoons. Like there is a certain look and stuff and a certain sensibility that shows up. And it's just common sense when you see a cartoon that stands out as being something different. It makes it feel fresh. And there is right now opportunity. I'm trying to say something positive that there's opportunity for someone to come along who's going to have a totally different voice. And so they're not going to use tropes. If they can help it, I mean, you can do a new look on a trope anytime, but it takes a great, great cartoon to make a trope feel fresh. So maybe tropes are not necessarily didn't, the way uh, to go. Didn't Edward Steed sort of travel that, you know, that's a good example. I said hitter kind of guy. His stuff all looks like it's out of a Dostoyevsky novel. I, I like agree. A, and it's Leanne, like Russian Leanne peasants. Too. Yeah. Russian peasants wearing, uh, High heel boots beating a donkey. Yeah, he's got a certain Eastern block look that was yeah. that got away from the magazine. But Leanna Fink to me reflects a sort of uh the sensibility of being very personal, being raw, and trying to even a drawings depict something that I'm being very personal. I'm opening myself up to you. So I think that's a, an appeal. I actually did a cartoon is I took a Leanna Fink character which was a woman and then i took a edward steve character which was this kind of troll looking dude and i had him walking hand in hand in the park then i had this old couple sitting in the park bench and the guy says i remember when we were young and quirky 
<laughs> and it's the ultimate inside cartoon. Well, keeping with the metaphor, that's very inside baseball, though. Yes, but I'm guilty. You, I'm guilty of that myself, and I'm and I don't practice what I preach because when I say I should do something different, I don't think my cartoons have been fresh, and as a result, I'm not seeing success because I am going back to the tropes. I'm using crutches, and and I'm not doing the things that I should be doing to kind of come up with something that's going to the opposite field. Uh, I would just like to say we have a comment in from Paul Nezja saying, love Edward Steed. Okay. I'm sure that's in the sacred manner of love. And I have a question from him that I think we can all answer. He asked, briefs or boxers? Bob. Who does? Paul did? Paul did. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Well, I'll let you answer that, Michael. Go ahead. Commando. I yeah, it. it's got to be commando. Got to be commando. Right, what's another question? Um, my my good friend Bob Jacobs asks son because he always calls me son. When are you going to learn to draw? <laughs> he's serious, Marty. Yeah, I know he's serious. I wish and I could draw like you. I I like your style of drawing. I really do. I never learned it. It's not learned. It is effortless because there's a, no effort. No, it's like a virus. It's like you. Well, you gotta no. Let's let's be honest here, though. You yes. know, the thing is that your drawings definitely have a vanishing point in perspective, and I do not see our old and new cartoonists use those sort of um, principles. And so there are things that you do in your drawing. There's a lot right going on. So I, I don't want to just uh -huh. dismiss it as a joke. I am one of your biggest fans of your work. So anybody going to knock your work, even if it's you, I'm going to start throwing some punches. Oh, my. Yeah, I there got There you go. Look, there's, there's, there's perspective. I'm more into Sfamato and Chiaroscuro myself. Uh, and also, terms, what the hell does that mean? Oh, I don't know. I think they're types of pasta. <laughs> so, you know, there's like an Asian type of perspective where it doesn't go to a vanishing point but it elevates and that's because how you show space is yes you have it just going that way is that something you knew or you're just kind of figuring no, out i know i know that you knew, knew that, that when you were doing that yeah so my stuff is very very flat you're 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 a you're a much superior i'll even say this much superior draftsman than i am and but i don't even try to do that so I'm not going to compete well, at that level. This is, a bad, this is a bad example because there's a lot of examples in which you do have a perspective and vanishing point. It's also very extreme how you pick the vanishing point to all the way to the left and all the way to the right and seldom in the center, which is not my preference. Um, someone like Matt Diffie uses a central vanishing point often as opposed to you having it way to wow. one side or the other. I tend to think of my drawings as being on a stage, actually. So I, I think a very shallow space. I don't, I don't think my cartoons are happening in real life. Well, you know, you, you, you work within your own playground. You build a world in which you have your own rules. For instance, let's say Michael Maslin, who I'm friends with, I know. So I'm gonna, I know his work a lot, so I'm going to just mention his as an example. And that is he has almost a slight bird's eye view in which you're looking down, and the ground yes. plays a role in his cartoon setup. Oh, now, now Paul, Paul says wants... he loves. Sorry, Paul now says he loves our cartoons as well. So we now, love. Now, Paul. now he wants a favor or something. Paul is, as people know, is always asking people for money, and I, um, I, I think I owe him something. a crypto caption. Paul, it's in the mail. I promise. But Paul's really good with words and captions. And he's a person who's been a multi-finalist in the caption cartoon. So and I, I really, yeah, Paul's really sharp. I Keep hope going, that, Paul. yeah, I think that's enough log rolling there. All right. Yeah. Um, so what do you guys already, got coming up? Um, we're going to wrap this up, but what do you guys thanks. have coming up this week in the, in the world of cartoons, Bob, are you still having any of your sit down chat meetings with, um, with your little, round table uh, at a diner and coffee and going through batches with the guys? No, actually we've been kind of um, dispersed. People are actually very worried and they're trying to keep their distance. And, you know, everyone knows somebody who got sick again. No. So and on top of it, 
do you, guys do, a, but do you guys do things on Zoom to kind of... Uh, no, people got exhausted from that. I mean, I've okay. been doing my own... I'm doing work on some other projects. I'm working on um, illustrating some books. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a textbook in Portugal on the existence of God. Um, and that's a philosophy book for a college. I'm also working on another textbook on bigotry. And that's a very high tech uh, book, but it's going to be illustrated with gag cartoons. And in all these books, I'm asked to bring in humor to very dry, difficult topics that are hard to grapple with. Um, I'm doing another book on, on death. So these are all subjects that initially don't seem like it's possible to inject humor, but that's why I'm being brought in. Ah, we had ah, a nice comment all... from Jerry Fisher. He enjoyed the podcast, the live Way to go, Jay screen. Fish. Yeah. Nice. That was his first and last time. No, so, he'll be back for the next. He'll time. be back. And he's, Jerry, actually, on, he's actually our guest next week. Go subscribe to the podcast on 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 Spotify and Apple and and wherever else that um, we are. Can we give a teaser and tell people who's coming up in the podcast? We have we have a couple of shows. Right Ed's across. coming up. We have Ed that's uh, it's been in the can for like two months, and I'm way late on putting up two shows. We have two shows to put up that were part of the first season. And um, those are going to go up. And uh, Yeah, and one of them is to, Neil Young. We're going to have to put up a ton of new shows that we haven't recorded yet. So um, Ooh, we're we in can, our second season. We can start doing the shows like this, too. I kind of like this. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, no, Bob, um, Bob's got Bob's to get a better haircut. <laughs> Well, this is yeah you know, again with the hair. You know what we're going to do though is we want Bobby, people. Got to... in your teeth. You need to. Yeah. Does he? No, no. That's that's yeah. just his mouth. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. No, it's the missing tooth. That was when you and me got into that bar fight. That's another story for another podcast. Oh my! But, um, we do want people to write in, and we want to give out shout outs to people who are doing projects. If you're doing a book, you're doing um, something interesting in the cartoon world. We want to be a part of the cartoon community, give out a little love, get a little publicity, and let us yeah. know if you have any suggestions. Uh, I have I have one more question from Mr. Steve McGinn. Steve which, McGinn. Yes. Did Vip and Picasso really get into a nasty bar fight once? Something about eyes. And uh, Vip, of course, was Virgil Parch. And I'm going to say, yeah, it happened. Thanks, Steve, for that question. That was a good answer, Sha. Yeah. It happened. You know, very thoughtful. You know, a good producer usually tries to fact check. And while that's going on, he should just check and see if that's, you know, because there's so many stories are going out there. And we have like, I don't know, two, three listeners, million visitors. Five. Five. <laughs> there's five people watching Hell this yeah. live right now. If you can okay, believe. great. So, but that, when this gets taped and it gets goes viral, we yeah. want to get our facts straight. Not We're not going to have one moment edited out. Good. Uh, Paul and I, See, Paul I likes the live podcast. I also Boom. have a an answer Thanks, to Paul. Steve Stoliar, but I lost this question. Then make one up. Steve's not going to know. No, no. I, I, have the, I answered it. I couldn't find the question. But it, yes, I have crumpled a few roughs into my charcoal chimney in a pinch. Thanks for check, checking in. The charcoal chimney, of course, is used to start the, your barbecue when you don't want the flavor of lighter fluid to influence the taste of your final product. Mm. Nice commercial so, break. Nicely thank done. You. I have one day we have to do a podcast of just gossip where I just throw down. You're the gossip. I got no gossip. Yeah, uh -huh. I just heard recently from Bruce Eric Kaplan, and I've heard I heard yesterday from Bob Mankoff. So what, I dirt? Am, you have some that dirt that you want to dish? No, people, I don't think you people should check use, in. I don't wanna people I don't wanna spill in. too much tea that's gonna get us no uh, no just people checking in. People like to know what other people are up to though. And uh, when it comes to that, I think we could share what people are working on and just share what people have been up to. When people are asking where is this person, that person, I and mean, that's why we had like Matt Diffie on once. Yeah. That was good to check in on him and what he's doing, even though he kept me out of his rejection book. As you could see, no harm, no no grudge or anything. I've let it go, and I'm, I'm not bringing it up or anything. 
It's only been, yeah, you've only brought it up nine times. It's, it's hard. You've hardly mentioned it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like the odd couple line. Rejected. The the ultimate humiliation. Oscar and Felix gets chucked out of group therapy. Bob, Bob's uh, rejected rejections can go into your fire starter thing. Yes. Is a rejected, rejected, a rejected rejection and acceptance. True story. I submitted 20 cartoons for the rejection collection. They were all rejected. That is, and that is, uh, uh, fit, not fit. You know, know, I'd like to, I'd like to end with, there was a question is what's your favorite New Yorker cartoon? And I really don't have one, but, uh, since we've talked about Bruce, Eric Kaplan, I, I really do enjoy his, I wish I was a better speck of dust cartoon. And it's just a little word balloon, and the last little bubble becomes the speck of dust. And, you know, aren't we all specks of dust in the end? And it tastes like chicken. Yes. Uh, you know, Michael, I'm, Michael, I'm going to say my cartoon. favorite Bruce Eric Kaplan cartoon um, of mine is when he has this couple walking down the street, and this woman looks exasperated and throws her arm in the air and says, Do we have to like graphic novels now? <laughs> the blue. He makes it work. Anyone else does that? Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing. Uh, listen, all right. Well, yeah. let's end it there. Uh, thanks right, everyone guys. for listening to the cartoon pad. Thank you to Michael for being thanks, Bob. a trooper. Michael is a uh, you know a real trooper because he's heavily medicated right now and sedated. Marty, thanks for the good job you did of not having to edit anything and finding the shortcut. And, and barely speaking. It's very thanks, nice Marty. to be here. No problem. Uh, uh, Marty, my wife loves your voice, by the way. Well, thank she you thinks, very she much. Thinks you, she thinks you've got a set of pipes on you, buddy. Well, <laughs> if she wants to tune in, I'll be doing Talk Word, uh, my podcast that I do without you two fools, oh, gosh. Uh, on Thursdays at 3 o'clock. So if she wants to tune in live, I'm talking to someone about their new book. That I just had to read earlier today. So, and who is it? Who's your guest? Uh, it's an author named Haley McGee, and it is a book called "The Ex Boyfriend Yard Sale" or something like that. So, if people want to listen to Talk Word Live, I'm on tomorrow, three o'clock. Are, bar- are the ex boyfriends buried in the yard? It sounds like a Stephen King. I think that would be a very interesting twist, but I haven't gotten to that part of okay. the book yet. So maybe, maybe they are all dead. If you and do any selling other organs, I don't know exactly. We, who knows? Maybe if you do any ASMR, let me know. Absolutely. Okay, okay. let's end it there, folks. Oh, look at me! I have one of yeah. Bob Eckstein's cart- rejected cartoons. Yes, here, here's my chimney. Here's my uh, charcoal chimney. <laughs> let's eat some steak, people. Good times, guys. Okay. Great oldies. Words okay, hurt. Thanks for your time. So let it be written. So let it be drawn. See you guys next week. Bye. Bye.